All right, again, we are recording this. So we'll start over. Again, the other one is one that recirculates or flips. Um, this is an investor that's going to purchase the property, refurbish it, remodel it, and then sell it once it's remodeled. Pretty simple. But when you start working with an investor, you get a lot of investors that are going to call and they're going to say, hey, I want to start flipping houses. I just want to start you know, renting houses. And if you don't know the questions to ask and things to do, uh, you could get into a, a lot of problems. So some of the questions that you need to ask is, first of all, have you done this before? If they say, no, this is going to be the first time. All right, then you're going to have to educate them on the process and the numbers and everything else. And if it's a profit, profitable uh, investment or if it's not, it's going to be a lot. If they have done it before, um, it's great. Just some of the ones that have done it before, uh, the, they may want you involved and they may want you just to write the offer for them. It's really going to depend. And you're going to find that out by talking to them and asking them the questions. So the next thing I ask, are you looking to hold or flip? You're going to rent it or you're going to flip it because it makes a difference on what they're going to buy. If they're going to buy it to hold and they're going to want to buy it at a fair price to where they're going to make a profit. And we're going to get into the numbers here in a little bit. If they're buying it to flip, they're going to buy an even lower price to where there's room to rehab it and make some money, right? So it's a big difference. Then I ask, what kind of return do you expect? Um, they're looking for a percentage on their investment, meaning I want to make 10%, 20% of the money I put into it. Others are just looking for a dollar amount. Maybe they only want to make 5,000, 10,000, things like that. It really just depends. But again, you need to know that because if they just say, hey, I want to buy this house, um, and the numbers don't work, you know, they're not going to be mad at you. I had some friends of mine that I sold a house two years ago. They called me and they said, hey, um, we're looking to buy this property. It happened to be right up the street from where they lived. And it was about a $230,000 house. And I was like, are y'all looking to move? Because it was smaller than what they had. They had a couple of kids. And they said, uh, no, we're looking at it for an investment property. And I said, well, the numbers don't work. You know, I mean, 235000 your payment's going to be, what? At the time, it was going to be about $1,800 a month. And I said, you're going to rent for $1,600, $1,800. You're not making any money. So I ran the numbers with them. And then I sat down and kind of went through this whole thing with them, had them put together what I call their model. And now they own four rental properties. And they're looking for more. So um, it's important to cover this process because you'll, be, you'll build a relationship that will do a lot of business with you. I also ask things like, do you have a, your own contractor to complete their model, remodel or you would be doing it yourself? So some investors come in and they need to go and find it, find uh, what work needs to be done, manage the contractor, go out and make sure it's done, hit, make sure the payments are made, permits are pulled if needed. That's not your job. It's not. So don't get into that. It also depends on uh, the timeline. So if they're going to do it themselves, then I'll ask things like, well, what do you do for a living? How many hours do you work a week? How much time are you going to actually have to work on it, right? Because if they work on a full-time job and they're going to work on the evenings and weekends, it's going to take a lot longer. And what does that mean? Do you think numbers are going to change? Yes. Carrying costs are going to change. It could even change what they're going to get for it. If they take, keep it for six or nine months, the market could easily be changed by them, right? So it really matters. Um, how much are they looking to spend? Obviously, we've already covered agency with them, but we want to ask, what are you looking to spend? If they say, I'm going to spend, you know, $100,000. Awesome. You know, is that the purchase? Is that including the rehab? Is that all the cash you have? You need to know that, right? Because if you're looking for a property and you have 100K and the rehab is going to be 30 or 40,000, which is about what most are that aren't too bad, um, which means you're put, making a purchase price of what? 
They got hundred thousand dollars, and they can spend thirty to forty on a rehab. They're looking about seventy grand, right? If they're just paying cash. This is this is the flip, right? I think I got someone trying to get in. Oh, nothing will happen. Um, you also need to find out, I mean, if it's cash, it's great. You just need to know how much because it's going to matter what they're going to buy. If it's going to be financed, um, then you need to know, are you doing, again, a hold or a flip? Because if it's financed, most lenders aren't going to finance some of the money for short term. It's going to be a long-term hold. The only ones are going to get short term on or it's going to be like hard money lenders. We're going to get into different types of financing a little bit later. Um, sorry, let me scroll this down. Yeah. If it's a hard money lender, make sure they've worked. If it's a hard money lender, make sure they've worked with one in the past so they understand all the fees involved, right? Some people, new investors, we have a lot of new investors in town. They'll say, I'm going to use my VA loan to buy this. They don't understand the VA loan process. It's 100% financing, right? Can't do that for an investment, right? So if they're going to use financing for a flip, it's either going to have to be cash, it's going to have to be hard money, and there's some other ways we'll talk about in a little bit. But the fees for hard money, there's points. Everybody know what a point is, right? They said there's one point, it's 1% or whatever the purchase price is. Most hard monies have two points up front and two points when they close. Meaning, I mean, two points when they purchase and two points whenever it goes to uh, when they release the loan. So that's four points on the money. It's $100,000, that's $4,000. A lot of times if it's hard money, and it, hard money means it's just an investor, it's an uninsured loan, they're going to lend that person the money for a short period of time. For them to be able to use it for an investment, they'll even lend them the money for doing the rehab. Usually, it's a, again short time to where they'll they can use it to um, refinance after they get into the property. They don't care the condition of the property; they care they're looking more at the the numbers. Is the property worth it? Normally, it's an interest only payment, meaning their monthly payments are about a thousand dollars a month, and they have to have it paid back in six months. So it's a short-term loan. But there's no collateral. The collateral is the property. It's not like a personal loan. So they don't really look much into your finances. When I say, I guess they used for not looking at collateral. They don't really look at your finances. It's more about the property and how much of a, how much of a uh, return there is. So, to put a lien on the property is absolutely yes. That's that's actually the collateral. That's why I said I was broke. I'm sorry. Yeah, but they don't look into your finances. They don't really care much about your credit. They're looking more about how many times have you flipped in the past. Interest rates are like 12 percent or more. They're high. But again, if it's short term, you know, it's only interest only payments. And then when you close, you pay more points. It's it's a lot more money. You're going to figure have to figure out what the terms are for that hard money so that you're calculating it in. Uh, on your rehab costs, and we're going to get into that a little bit later. I also asked them, like, what type of product are you looking for? Are you looking for a single? Family, are you looking for, they don't want a mobile home. They don't want to mess with rehab in a mobile home. Some don't want a townhouse. They just want a, just a regular stick-built house. Some don't care as long as there's money involved. A lot of your good investors, they're not going to care. As long as there's a profit to be turned, they don't care, right? So, but still ask that question because if someone looking to, to rent, to hold, they may not want a single-family home. They may want just a stick uh, a mobile home, or they may want a mobile home park, or may, they may want a townhouse. So ask that question. And when you're asking these questions, you're building the investor's model, meaning things like, what kind of house do you want? What are you looking to spend? What kind of return, right? You can see how you're building their model. 
as far as what kind of a what kind of a property they're looking for, along with what the return is. I even ask, is there a certain area you want to keep close to? Again, a lot of your investors, they don't care. Meaning all they care about uh, is wanting to make money. So they don't care what part of town it is. If they feel, if you feel to make them money, then they want it. And that's where they're going to lean on you. Is it, do you feel it's going to make them money? Make sense? A lot of investors may or may not do inspections. Some investors are going to want them, some aren't. If it's a property that's on a septic, don't make that an option for your buyer, investor, because they could buy it, get into it, and realize that this septic system is going to be no good, and now they're going to spend 15, 20 grand to fix it. They're going to be very mad. Other inspections like HVAC, home inspections, things like that, you know, if the property's on a foundation and the investor themselves don't look at it, um, you definitely want to have someone take a look at the foundation because that could be another huge expense. Again, your job working with investors is to make sure that you're protecting them. A lot of investors, good investors, will be able to walk through the property and see and tell what's wrong. They won't, they won't need an inspection because they, they've just done it so much. They can tell and they know what the costs are. But if you get a new investor, you're gonna, they're going to be walking through and they don't know, hey, those windows are bad and how much it's going to cost or this foundation feels off right they don't they don't know so when you you're asking these questions important because they're going you then you understand how much you're going to have to really hold their hand and you still are going to really hold their hand until you figure out hey they know what they're doing if you get an investor that knows what they're doing all you're really doing is just finding the property for them putting the paperwork together and they handle the rest if it's somebody that doesn't know what they're doing you're doing a lot more a lot more meaning they're going to have to figure out how much it's going to cost to rehab before you make the offer because you, you may or may not understand how to calculate that or figure that out you may not know that it, how much a window costs to replace or a new roof or new flooring or painting a house right all those are huge factors when working with an investor and we're not going to get into how much different things cost because we could probably be here all day talking about how much different things are going to cost based on the house um i can i can give you a general idea when you're looking at a property if it needs just your basics meaning your paint floors updates outside appliances probably 15 to 20 grand depending on the size of the house if you start getting into new roof new windows things like that uh, uh, you're probably pushing even hvac now you're 30 40 grand so it kind of gives you an idea, and it really depends on how bad it is and how much it's going to cost. A new roof could be anywhere from eight to 12 grand, depending on the size of the house. So let's talk a little bit about financing. Some basic financing and knowing the numbers. For a hold property, you need to know what the intent is for the investor. Are they financing the purchase? paying cash for the for the rehab or are they going to try to finance all of it meaning um they want to buy it and fix it up and then do a refinance and take everything into it because that matters when you're calculating in how much it be we're going to do an exercise on that here at the end so they buy a house for a hundred thousand costs 20 to rehab and then they're going to go refinance it because of how, let's say the property is worth about 180. So they can refinance up to 80% of whatever the property is worth on an investment property, right? Some banks are 70, some are 80. So they refinance it. Um, so now they're refinancing 120,000. So you have to calculate the monthly payment at 120,000 versus what the rent rate is, which we'll talk about that in just a little bit when we go through the exercise of the numbers down below to make sure that there's going to be, uh, they're going to make enough money. There's a method out there you may have heard of called the Burr method. It's B-R-R-R-R, -R -R -R, which means buy, rehab, refinance, and repeat. So if you ever hear anybody say the Burr method, the Burr method is you buy the property, you rehab it, you refinance it to get your money back, 
and then you repeat it, meaning you just go do it again. So you would actually buy the property at a low enough price to where when you refurbish it, in other words, put the 20000 like we just gave the example, you'd have 120000 in. You refinance it for, let's say, one thirty. So you get your 120 that you had into it. Everybody tracking? Along with the extra $10,000. So you made $10,000. So now you refinance for 130. You get your cash back to 120, and then let's go do it again. You buy another one, you do it again. That's the Burr method. So if you ever hear Burr method, that's what that stands for. A lot of investors will talk that talk that type of language. At least you understand what it is. If you're looking to finance, most lenders are going to require 20% down. They'll finance properties of $50,000 and up, but they also charge a lot of points. So when I say finance, I'm talking about uh, regular financing like a conventional loan versus a hard money loan. If they're going to do a hold, they can do a conventional loan, which is 20% down. Now, if they're doing a property that they're going to buy with a conventional loan, you need to make sure the property is going to be uh, in a good enough condition where it's going to pass appraisal. So when you're walking through the property and you see things like holes in the floor, or broken windows, things like that, a conventional loan isn't as strict as a, a VA. I mean, a conventional appraisal isn't as strict as a VA appraisal, but they will look for health and safety issues, meaning holes in the floors, holes in the windows, roof leaks, things like that. So look at safety. If your railing or your deck is higher than 32 inches, it has to have a railing. They'll look at all that, and that'll all be called on an appraisal for repairs. Has to be habitable, yes. But the condition of it isn't as, doesn't have to be as good as VA. Yep. Um, we're not going to get into a lot of different financing today because we could probably spend a whole day talking about financing in different types. I'm just covering some basic types today. When you talk about conventional loans, so you make an offer and you ask the seller to contribute the closing costs to a buyer. Well, a buyer can only receive 2% of the sale price for closing costs on a conventional loan. So if you have a $100,000 house you're buying and you're asking for $4,000 in closing costs, a lender is only gonna let them get 2,000 because that's 2%. So you need to know that when you make the offer. Does that make sense? Anybody in here like numbers? Who in here is good with numbers? Anybody? Nobody. Great. I'm the only one in the room that loves numbers. All right. Well, we're going to get into some numbers here in a little bit. If they're doing a flip, due to lending guidelines, the purchase will need to be, and what I mean by lending guidelines is, if you go and get a conventional loan, you can't do a conventional loan and only keep it for a few months. They won't let you do it because they ask you the intent. How long do you keep it? plan on keeping it? And if you, not to means that you obviously can't do it and then pay it off later, um, but you won't be able to do a loan with that lender. They won't let you do it. When you sign documents at closing, your intent is to keep that property for a long period of time. So when you do a flip, you need to, there's only a certain, a few ways to get it that I'm going to talk about. One is going to be cash, obviously. And again, how much cash do you have? Does it include the rehab? Things like that. The other one we talked about is hard money. When I say hard money, it is just, a, a, again, a type of financing that isn't, um, isn't insured by the FDA or anybody else. It's basically somebody like Michelle's going to lend Brandon $200,000. And Michelle has all this money, uh, or all these points and fees involved to where it's profitable for her to take that money and lend it to him on a short period of time. Does that make sense? Now, during that time, obviously, there's going to be a lien on the property so that if Brandon runs away with her cash, she can keep the property and get her money back by the, for the property. However, uh, it, they don't do documents. They don't look at things like um, uh, your income. They don't look at your tax returns. They don't care about any of that. They may look at your credit. That's just to determine if you pay your bills. They're really not too concerned about that. 
They're more concerned about, again, experience. How many flips have you done? How many home properties do you have? Because if you've done a lot of that, the, your rates isn't going to be as high and your the amount they're going to lend you is going to be higher. The more you do, the more they're going to lend you and the less, the less control they're going to have. Owner financing. That's another way that you can get flips, meaning you go to the homeowner and say, look, I'll give you... I'll give you twenty thousand um, dollars today, and within the, within a year, I'll give you the remaining eighty. I'm going to buy your property for a hundred thousand dollars, but today I'm going to give you five thousand, ten thousand, twenty thousand dollars. And you could coordinate owner financing. You can do all sorts of different things. So I'm just you know this is just a kind of a simple guide, meaning five or twenty thousand dollars down. I'll make a payment to you of $500 a month of interest only. And that by the end of the first year, uh, you'll have the whole $100,000. So they're actually making more because if it's $500 a month, that's $600 for the year, right? And at the end of the note, you still owe, if they put $20,000 down, they still owe 80 grand. So they're making actually 100,600 bucks. Some homeowners are just going to be like, yay, I'm okay with that. They need some money right now to get them through a hump, to get them somewhere else, and they get the rest later. Again, that's another day. We talk about creative financing and all different options and ways you can play that out. Creative financing would be something like what's called subject to. Anybody here is subject to? You've heard that? Anybody know what that is? Anybody? Wholesalers do it a lot, yes. But it's not necessarily just wholesalers, but yeah. Yep. Isn't that where, like, I mean, you don't do anything with your bank? You, the seller, you can have up there. I just want the property and I want to take it in. We talked a little bit about that here before. And basically, what it is, is I'm going to, yeah. Uh, what a subject to on creative financing is I'm going to just pay your mortgage. I'm going to give you $5,000 now so you can go and relocate and do what you need to do. And what we're going to do is we're going to transfer the deed of the property into my name. And then I'll just keep making your mortgage payments and everything else. So it's subject to the loan that you currently have on the property. And normally there's a timeline there on when that has to be paid off on a on a flip meaning you know we'll do it for a, a six month or a year period and at the end of the year i'll refinance it or i'll have it closed and pay you the difference and pay it off it's kind of like an owner financing but there's a loan on the property so you have to figure out how to get around the loan to where you own the property and that would be a subject too because then the deed goes in your name as an investor i understand that the seller has a loan on the property. And I understand that the seller could do what's called an on-demand clause, meaning you transfer the deed over from the seller's name to your name and the mortgage company finds out there's a clause in the mortgage documents that say, if any of that changes without, without the lender's permission, the, the mortgage company's permission, then they can call the note due on 100%, right? That's an on-demand clause. Well. Most lenders don't track that. They have too many other things going on to see that. But if they would catch that, then they would say, okay, Michelle, you sold that property. You changed the deed. We didn't give permission. We still have a mortgage. You need to pay us our money because we no longer, you no longer have that property in your name. So it's not a great way to do things, but a lot of people do that. If anybody that you work with is doing a flip, make sure they understand there's what's called a seasoning period for FHA loans. So when they put it back on the market to sell, they bought it two months ago, they put it back on the market today because it's been flipped, right? Well, the buyer cannot get an FHA loan on that property if it's within 90 days. So if I bought it and I go to sell it and it hasn't been 90 days, I can I can't accept an FHA loan on that property. A buyer brings me an offer, and if it's an FHA loan, I can't accept it. I mean, I can, but the buyer is not going to be able to get it because it won't pass FHA guidelines. 
FHA, there's a seasoning period of 90 days. So if you get a flipper that's really good, that does the work themselves, and can turn it in a few weeks and let's go and put it back in a market, that's cool. It's all right. But we're only taking VA loans, conventional loans, cash, right? You can't do FHA or USDA. USDA is another product of FHA. So it has to be has to be seasoned for at least 90 days. Make sense? Let's talk a little bit about the numbers. Great. So let's go through an example of the numbers. When I say run the numbers, this is what I'm talking about. So let's do for a flip. Um, Remember, when you're talking with an investor, some investors aren't going to want you to get into the numbers. That's why I have it's not about one sale, right? Some investors aren't going to want you to get into the numbers, but you need to insist to get into the numbers to make sure that they're getting a good sale. Because they're going to go on Zillow, they're going to go somewhere else, and they're going to look at pricing, and they're going to think it's going to sell for more than what it's actually going to sell for in today's market. How long are homes selling on the, staying on the market? It's actually up to 70 days now. Average is 70 days. That's changed since, what, a month ago? Because it was 45 is what we talked about. It's slowed down. The market has slowed down. So uh, knowing that when you're talking to an investor, we know that the market's starting to shift. Values are coming down. Anybody list a house now where it's comparable to new construction? Yep, I know Brandon did. Right? We start prices of changing and builders are offering concessions. Right? They're offering a ten thousand dollar concession. So we're getting back to that market like 2012, where you have a new construction price the same as a resale, and the builders are offering all these incentives, which will cover things like blinds and fences and things like that, right? So Investor needs to know that. And again, it's not about one sale. It's about all the other business he can do with you if you look out for them. So by doing that, uh, I mean, knowing the numbers, you can do that. So for this example one, let's say that they acquire the property for $125,000. That's with closing costs, right? In other words, all their costs involved with buying the house. We're going to talk more about that in a minute as far as the differences. They predict the rehab is going to be 40K. That's what they spent. Holdover fees. Do you all know what I mean by holdover fees? So holdover fees are things like utilities, lawn maintenance, right? It's also if they're doing hard money, it's going to be interest on the loan. It's going to be insurance on the property. And you can even figure in taxes because taxes are going to be prorated too. So those are your holdover fees. You know, you could probably figure somewhere around $400 a month. Power is going to be about 100, 100, 150, depending on how much they use the AC. Water, you know, if it's in the county is what, $25 a month? City, $75 a month? See how it's important to know these things? Insurance, yep, and if you want to do prorated taxes, but it's usually calculated in the sale and the closing. Um, then you have lawn maintenance, you know, and if they mow it themselves, they don't have to, but keeping that in your head and to make sure you account for that, I'd rather plan high and, and then make more. Um, so the next thing is selling fees, meaning if we're going to resell it for 210 right? For instructional purposes, we're probably going to charge 5% instead of 6 because it's an investor and they're going to do repaint business, right? So at 5% for 210 is 10 grand. And if you put in a couple thousand for closing costs and attorney fees, you're at about 13,000. You understand how I got to 13,000? Everybody tracking that for resale fees? Resale is commission and everything else. And then we resell for 210. You're going to make 30,000. If you add the 125 and the 40, you come up with 165, right? And then the two puts 167. And then the 13 comes up to what? 180? 170? So 180, you take 180 and you subtract it uh, 210, from 210, 
you come up with 30. That's how I come up with 30,000. Everybody make track of me? So the investor says, I want to make $20,000 on the property. Is that, does that qualify? Is that going to work for him? How long is it going to take you to flip? Uh, probably about six months. Still a pretty good margin there, meaning 20 to 30 difference if the market softens to where he could still be all right, right? If it takes that long. If they say, I want to make 30000 and we're calculating 30000 a day, that's pretty tight, isn't it? You just got to tell them that. If they say, I want to make forty grand, well, it doesn't hit the numbers. If he goes online and Zillow says, I can sell for um, 240 and not 210 well, he's thinking that he's going to be really good, right? See how it's important to understand that and be able to explain that to an investor? Does that make sense? Kind of felt a little clunky going through that. We're going to do an exercise. We actually do one here in a minute. Let's do a hold. If they say they want to rent, let's say they're going to finance 160000 And for instructional purposes, let's say the payment on that finance, amount financed, is 1500 Now that's mortgage, that's PITI, mortgage, taxes, insurance, everything is involved. They can rent the property for today for $2,000. Okay, is that a good investment? Well, let's see. It's a $500 spread, right? If they're putting $1,500 a month out for rent or for mortgage, and today's rent's $2,000. Let's look at the cost to rent. The first thing they have is 10% of the rent goes towards management fees. So 10% of $2,000 is $200. Bucks. So now we went from a $500 a month profit down to a $300 a month profit, right? Some other things they need to think about is holdover or vacant property. You got to figure about a month and a half of rent, rent, utilities, maintenance. So if somebody moves out and it doesn't re-rent for a month, they have that month's mortgage, right? Then they have that month's utilities. That's why I say a month and a half. So that just dropped that down quite a bit. If you do the calculations for what it costs per month. You know, $2,000 $2, over a year period is how much a month? How much? $24. $24? If I spread, if I have today's rent of $2,000, right? And I want to try to spread that over a year period, meaning I want to, I want to, I want to make up for that in a year. So, um, no, no, you're going over 12 years. If I have, let's say I want to make a make payments on a $2,000 bill and I want to have it paid off in a year. Well, how much would I have to pay each month to have it paid off in a year? 166, okay? So that means when I'm thinking about one and a half months rent, I need to be thinking about 100, we'll just say about $165 also is being charged a month, kind of like a management fee. Does that make sense? And if we just say 150 bucks, we'll make it easy. We'll be even, we'll be even easy, okay? So we have $150 a month of holdover fees to compensate for one and a half months rent when the house is not rented that we have to pay for that. Is everybody tracking? Did I lose everybody on that one? I mean, I'm talking about for that. You good, Tony? Okay. So right now, management fees for two hundred dollars a month, holdover fees to compensate for the two thousand dollars that we're not going to get for one month's rent. We have to figure out how to recoup that to make sure we're calculating our annual income, right? Annual income. Here, we'll get there. We'll get there. Um, on the annual, on the annual today's rent for annual, what they would make would be twenty four thousand. At two thousand a month, would be twenty four thousand. If we have one month where it doesn't rent, they'd make twenty two thousand. So we're trying to compensate for that. Okay. And then we have repairs. 
this is like a depends on the condition the property if they want to put that in that's up to the that's up to the uh, owner the investor on how they calculate this okay these are things that investors look at some have extensive spreadsheets for this and algorithms and percentages I just want you to see this so you understand what an investor is going to look at when I look at a rental property I'm not looking at what it's going to rent today I'm looking at what it's going to rent at in a couple years on a regular market because today's rents are inflated quite a bit so if it can rent for two thousand a day, what do you think it could rent on a market that's slower? Fifteen, sixteen, right? So if we do just a basic number breakdown, basic numbers, meaning we don't talk count into holdover fees, we have a really good rent rate, and we break the numbers down. If we have a rent of two thousand dollars, management fee is two hundred bucks a month, our mortgage is $1,500 a month, they're making $300 a month, right? We haven't accounted for any holdover, we haven't accounted for any repairs. Basic is $300 a month, and that's today's rent. See what I was saying just, okay? That's today's rent. Is that a good rent? Is that a good return? That's right. And that's what you have to be able to explain to an investor is like, look, sure, you can make, because right uh, on face value, an investor's thinking they're making how much? 500 a month. So you have to ask them, are you managing it yourself? Are you going to rent it out yourself? They say, no, I can't. I don't have time for that. I'm going to use a management company. Well, management companies, they usually charge 10% of the rent. Does that make sense? Everybody tracking? So they charge about 10% of the rent. And are you going to try to rent it on a high end or just a fair value? Because that affects what? Holdover, vacancies. If they put it at a fair value each month and it comes back in the market, well, it's going to rent right away. But if they try to rent it for as high or higher than what the market value is, it's going to set. And they're going to have to calculate that in. Now, you don't get into the property management and rental side of things. This is all just making sure that it's a good investment or not. Does that make sense? Yeah, and we do this, we can just do one time frame, we can just do rough numbers and say, Sure. We have any done hard numbers. That's right. That's right. Look, you're not the one that's going to tell them yes or no. You're just giving your professional advice. I have another investor of mine, he's bought 15 rental properties, uh, and none of them all here in the United States, not, I mean, in, in North, North Carolina. Some are in New York. And they'll ask me, can you look at it and run the numbers? And I'll, this is what I tell them. Looking at what I'm seeing, you're going to make about 300 a month. Rents, I don't know what the economy is right there, but everywhere it seems pretty good. What happens when the economy shifts? And you have to drop rent a couple hundred dollars a month. Are you going to make anything? There's a lot of stuff online and it, like I was telling you about this basic stuff for repairs and holdover fees, they get into prorating taxes, they get into insurance, they get into everything, all the details of it all, right? This isn't meant to do that. This is just meant to give you a basic guide, understanding things to talk about with investors to make sure that they're getting into something that's not going to, they're not going to lose their asset. They're not going to, um, uh, buy a bad investment because the last thing you want to do is sell them an investment property and then three months later they're like man it's being foreclosed I can't manage this I, I'm not making anything I had to rent it for 1500 a month and we were planning for 2000 my mortgage is 1500 a month then I had the AC go out and I put $600 you see what I'm saying so yeah I can go bad quick so when you're talking to someone that's looking to sell and they want to rent their property this will also help you with that, right? By asking is simply what? How much is your mortgage? What would the property rent for today? Today's rental rates are about a dollar a square foot in Onslow County. It's about a buck a square foot. So if you have a house that's 1,500 feet a square feet, it's probably going to rent for 1,500 a month. Unless it's like a townhouse. It's like eight or 900 square feet because those are renting for anywhere from 
a thousand to fifteen hundred a month. It's crazy. A townhouse can rent for the same as a twelve hundred square foot single family, three bed, two bath, two car garage. I know because I'm doing it. Uh, about 60, 70 cents a square foot. For example, I have a I have a townhouse. It's a two bed, bath and a half. And probably, I don't know, eight, 10 years ago, it would have rented for about 850, 900 a month. That's, that's about a thousand square foot townhouse, two story right here in Jacksonville. And you figure 850, 900 a month is what I had how calculated in my head from running my numbers. And today it's renting for 1300 a month. 1300 a month for a two bed, one and a half bath with a one car garage townhouse in Jacksonville. And that's fair rent because that's what everybody else around me is renting for. And it's not even in the same condition. Meaning mine's better condition than just keep my, my shit in good shape. About 60 to 70, it just really depends. I mean, I don't know where the market's going to go or how it's going to change. Yeah. 60, 70, and it really depends where the house is, the condition of it, everything else. All that comes into play. You know, a couple years ago when everybody was trying to find a house, it didn't matter. It really didn't matter the condition of it. But as we go further and further along, meaning, the market starts to change, it's gonna matter. We're already seeing that now, right? With, with resales. Make sense? One thing about interest rates being high is uh, it affects um, rental rates. The higher the interest rate, the higher the price of the house, their monthly payment, which means they can charge a higher rent because they're not gonna be able to buy it and be able to pay for it versus renting. They can rent it for cheaper. Does that make sense? So that's for a landlord or a property owner that makes uh, it more appealing. So let's do a couple different scenarios. Let me go back to this. Everybody online, are you good? Questions, comments? Am I losing everybody? I'm, good. I'm with Megan, we're good. If I'm breaking up, it's because the internet connection. I've already talked to IT about it this morning. Uh, I'm going to present my entire screen so that you can see this. Do what? Well, it depends on the property, right? Because for me, you know, no, no. I mean, for me, if I'm looking, I'm looking at a townhouse, right? Or even a single wide trailer that is a thousand square feet that I can get a thousand bucks a month out of. Holy shit. I mean, because the payment on it's going to be very, very low and the return is going to be high. Yeah. But what if you have to need that? Like, you know. Well, then you got to figure out all your fees and everything else involved. I mean, I'm talking about a single wide. You're not probably have to pay cash for those. Yeah. So you all this online, you should be able to see my screen where it has, uh, we're going to edit this. Can you all see that? Where I have the I scenario up. All right. So I have the yeah. scenario up and we're going to go through the scenario. So. Running this scenario, let's talk about how much an investor is going to have put into it. Let's say in this scenario, it's $145,000 for the purchase price. Okay. Closing costs. So when it, this investor is paying cash per the scenario, so closing costs on a cash sale is very low, meaning it's about two grand. Okay. Because they have attorney fees, they have recording fees. Um, if they put insurance on the property or not, uh, prorated taxes, things like that. So they don't have all the lender fees and everything else. And this is just a cash sale. So again, we go back up to our scenario. It says $45,000 for the rehab, right? And then what do you think we should put for holdover fees? 
How long do they say expect to take? Doesn't say, does it? We're going to say he's going to expect to take four months. So how much do you think the holdover fee should be? Remember, what are the holdover fees? Utilities, right? Okay. He's doing cash, though. He's not doing hard money. So what do you think it would be a month for holdover fees? $100 is going to pay you an electric bill, if that. He's saying 500 bucks. That's a fair fair guess. So four months, we're looking at two grand, right? Mark pays all the bills. So how much money do they have into it at this point? If we add 145, 2,000, 45, and 2,000, comes up to how much? 194,000. So let's look at the resale numbers. Market says it's going to resell for 235 once it's rehab, right? What's our resale fees? How much is it going to cost to sell it? As far as commissions and sale fees and things like that. If you do 5% five, 5 commission, then the other percent for closing costs, things like that. You could do six, six and a half, say 15,000. If you do, I think it's six and a half percent, it comes out to like 15 and some change. So we're just gonna, for instructional purposes, we'll say 15,000. So how much are they gonna clear from the sale? Which is 235 minus 15, 220. So how much did they make on this rehab? You take 220 and you minus 194 comes up with 26,000. Make sense? Is that a good flip? That meets their goals. That's right. So they say they want to make 30 grand and not so much. But if they say they want to make about 20 grand, good. Market can shift up. You know, when I'm. When I'm looking at numbers and I run a CMA on a situation like this, I'm probably going to look at what's active on the market and what's pending on the market and how long it's taken them to sell. Okay. I'll look at solds as well. So I see what the market is today. The actives and the pendings actually is going to tell me where it's going to be in about 30 to 60 days. Because when they close, that now becomes a new benchmark for, for a CMA, right? Everybody tracking me? Because it's a recent sale. So I'm probably going to do. A, I'm probably going to conclude um, pending sales, so that I know in four months my numbers are still going to be the same, or maybe they'll be better. You understand what I'm saying? If you're getting that deep into the rehab, yes, but I would suggest that you'd let the let them manage that piece. You know, the less the least you get involved with his his or her um, uh, managing and financing the rehab, the better off. You know, you have to run it off what they say. If they go over that forty five thousand dollar budget, that's not on you. That's on them. But if you get involved with it and you're like trying to cut, it ends up costing more because they tried to cut cut corners. Now they're gonna look at you, right? So unless you really know what you're doing and you're really good at the numbers, I'd suggest you just stay out of that and you let them manage that. You help them with the purchase. Yeah. You help them purchase it. You give them advice. You run the numbers and then let them manage it when they're ready to sell. Then you tell them where the market is today and let's go back on the market, right? For a flip. Make sense? So let's do one that's going to hold. So on this example, it's a townhouse, and they're buying it for one hundred twenty-five thousand. They're going to finance it. 
So if they finance it and put 20% down, how much are they financing? Hundred thousand. Yep. So they're financing a hundred thousand. So at a hundred thousand, um, what's their closing cost gonna be? Anybody have an idea? We're gonna plan for seventy five hundred dollars. The rehab amount was how much? Must be in pretty good shape, huh? Holdover fees. Didn't say, did he? Didn't say how long. If it's only 15,000, do you think it's gonna hold it for a long time? We'll probably figure three months, because if it takes him even a month to do it, and then he finally gets it listed to rent, it takes a month to rent. You see what I'm saying? We could be three months. Before he starts collecting, he or she starts collecting rent income. So we'll, we'll figure three months, and we'll use the same figure at $1,500 or $500 a month, just $1,500 in holdover fees. Make sense? So, how much cash do they have invested right now? Okay, plus the closing costs, plus the rehab, and plus the holdover fees. $25,000 down payment, $7,500 in closing costs, $1,500, right? Or $15,000, I'm sorry, in rehab. That right there puts us at $4,750. And then we have holdover fees of $1,500. It puts us at $49,000 they've got out of pocket right now. So what is their monthly payment? $700 a month is what we'll say for $100,000 loan. And that's principal interest, taxes, and insurance. Yep. So, what do you think the monthly rent on this property is going to be? Okay. We'll put twelve hundred. And management fees are how much? Now, emergency maintenance, a lot of Rental companies will put about $300 into it. And what emergency maintenance fee is, is uh, it's just a one-time fee. And that's that if uh, there's a plumbing leak, an HVAC leak, and they need to call um, they need to call somebody out to, uh, to fix it and they can't get a hold of you for permission, there's money in there to pay the contractor to get them out to fix it. Okay. Yes. Mm -hmm. They put that, they leave that in a trust account. Yep. But the total monthly income, we didn't do holdover. We didn't do any type of uh, vacancy rate or anything like that. So just basically $1,200 a month minus 120 puts us at how much a month? What we're gonna, our total monthly income on the rent? 1,080, right? So what's their monthly profit? 380 bucks a month. Is that a good investment? Again, it depends on what, whenever they're asking for their model, how much do you want to make a month? Right? They say, I want to clear $500 a month. That doesn't cut it, does it? Again, when I'm looking at an investment property, mine is $200 a month on a slow month, on a slow rent market. So we have that this property will rent for 1200 on a slow market, it would probably rent, let's say, for a thousand. So if I rent for a thousand dollars a month, that brings my monthly profit down to what? 180 bucks. And then if I run that, I just give it 60 cents. Yeah, 200. 200 bucks. Because my management fees now go down to 100 dollars instead of 120, which puts me at 200 dollars a month. Say that again. Mm -hmm. It's on a real bad market, 60 cents. So, mm -hmm. 
Um, questions about that? Again, this doesn't count for vacancies or holdover fees. Some investors don't care about that. They don't look at that because they'll just figure it's going to rent right away. They'll drop the price. And there's a lot of different strategies to get a property rented right away, meaning offer half off first month's rent, things like that, right? Don't. They're better off doing half off first month's rent than, than dropping the rent to, let's say, we have the house rented for $1,200 a month. And if you think about the math, if I drop it to $1,100 a month, right, I'm making over the year, over that year lease, I'm making how much less? $1,200 less. But if I just give a tenant half off first month's rent, that's only $600. So I only lose $600 on instead of dropping the price $100 a month. Does that make sense? So if you're... Yes. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Because then, you know, I would I would rather try to do a half off first month's rent. And if I drop it, I'll drop it to 1175 and then I'm in a year. But I'm also looking at my annual income versus my annual expenses. Right, and that's that's determined by what you're paying out monthly and everything else, and your maintenance and everything else. It's just you got to know the numbers. Sure. Yeah, but I mean, from twelve hundred to eleven seventy-five, it's not a big difference. Yeah. Yeah. Questions. Questions on working with investors. Again, today was just a basic guide so that you can help when you help an investor figure out what they want to do, what if they are well versed or educated in an in investment world, is you're gonna have a lot of people when we start having foreclosures and things like that come up, you're gonna get a lot of people calling you saying, Hey, I'm looking to do a flip. I'm looking to get investments. I'm an investor. Awesome. And you start asking these questions. Well, how much money do you have? Oh, I've got some good amount of money saved up. All right, what's a good amount of money? I got about 20 grand. Okay, what's 20 grand gonna get them? Let's reverse engineer the number. First, right? On an investment property, if I buy one at hundred thousand dollars, what's my down payment going to be? Which is twenty grand. Okay. Do I have any money for rehab? No. Do I have any money for closing costs? No. So whenever they say that, and you ask, you have to ask these questions. You have to know when you're working with an investor how much cash, because you'll get some that have done a lot of research. They've done. They're like the internet pros, right? They get online, they do all this research, they start saying burr method and things like that. Like, well, you must know what you're talking about. And then they say, well, I want to use my VA loan. As soon as they say that, that should click in your head that they are not a seasoned investor. I don't care what kind of language you're using, what online systems, because there are a lot of different ones out there. Um, there's one, I think, called Deal Check, where you can actually put it all in and it tells you, but it gets very detailed. It's pretty good. It's free. Um, and then you'll have some that uh, they don't know that, but they say, I've got some money saved. I got a bunch of money. I've been saving, saving, saving. How much do you have? They say they have $50,000, right? In today's market, can you get an investment property with $50,000 cash? Maybe. There's not that many out there like that. And the rehab is probably going to be 40 to 45. So by the time they try to do anything, remember, and this is investment to hold. If they're looking to flip, right? It's a different story. Yeah. Yeah. They need they need to talk to somebody that has money, which is we'll have a another day where we talk about how to find money, what to, how different different ways to finance properties without just conventional loans. We'll have to do that uh, as well because there's a lot of ways out there to get properties without just doing your conventional financing. All right, questions. Today was a little bit choppy just because working with investors it goes all over the place. Because there's so many different ways and so many different things 
again today was just to give you a basic foundation. Did y'all get anything out of today? Did it help understanding at least going through the numbers? And like trying to figure out a model. That's the main thing is trying to get an investor to figure out their model. Model being how much you're looking to make, right? What type of property, what area, and how much you want to spend. It's the basics. What are you going to do with it? Are you going to keep it to hold? And some investors are going to be like, well, it depends. If it can make money, I'll hold it. Otherwise, I'll flip it. They don't care. But if they don't understand the numbers, well. That's right. Okay. I think that's more of a conversation on sprinkler or a mannequin. That's right. Yeah. 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 A lot of people want to flip, but it's like, hey man, this is a place to raise a lot. It's going to hurt a lot. But they're going to be out from what I need to potentially hurt right. everybody and make more money. So if anything, it's like, it's not going to be. It's not gonna be as, it's, yeah, yeah, it's not gonna be as risky, but it's going to be like a marathon. Like, like you're not gonna make a ton of money. Like when you run the numbers and they see they're gonna cash flow, you know, two hundred twenty dollars a month. Yeah, when they're about to invest, right? Potentially like thirty thousand dollars cash. And I go back to like the linear goals. If you throw that thirty grand into a high yield savings account and make more than two hundred dollars a month. 